Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you to uh, Greenbelt Baptist Church. I know we have a, a bit of a different format this morning. If you're joining us from home, uh, we'd especially like to welcome you. And we, uh, I hope you know that we've been praying specifically for you this morning and for this time, uh, that the Lord uh, would use this in uh, perhaps our feeble attempt to continue worshiping the Lord in, in a kind of a, a more normal way that we normally would. We want to uh, not only just have the word preached, but to sing and, and do things that we can. So if you're by yourself, if you're in your small group, uh, we're glad that you joined us this morning. If you're new and this is the first time you've ever heard of Greenbelt Baptist Church, uh, we're grateful that you're with us this morning as well. Uh, I do want to say a quick word. Uh, this is not our normal run of things. We don't normally post videos. We want people to be here in church uh, and when we can. Uh, the Bible does prescribe us to gather together, and so uh, it, we feel that it's important to do that. And, and this is just really brought about by the special circumstances that we're, we're living under right now. Um, but, but we anticipate and we look forward to and pray that when uh, this time is over, when we can gather together in a more normal fashion, uh, that this kind of format will disappear for us and, and we'll uh, be back to our normal gathering together, our fellowshipping with one another, the way that the Bible prescribes us to worship. But now I want to open our time this morning reading from Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surround me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does violently valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, it is with joy, it is with humble hearts that we come before you in worship this morning. And our Father, uh, we give you thanks and praise that in your sovereignty and your divine plan and your divine foreknowledge and omniscience, none of this has caught you by surprise. Father, you have ordained all things. You have set all things in place by the word of your power. And Father, we trust your goodness in this time. We trust in your love towards your people in your sustaining grace and mercy towards us. Father, we, we thank you this morning that we can still come to you and worship. We thank you that you are still the Lord and God of this universe, worthy of praise, worthy of our worship. And Father, we do pray this morning that our worship would be acceptable in your sight. And it's in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing together now. If you have a hymnal, uh, one of our hymnals, you can uh, open that up. Uh, or if you uh, have the links open to the lyrics online, you can do that uh, even now. But, but let's sing together. Our first song is going to be uh, from our hymnal, hymn number 656, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dust as who that may be, Christ Jesus it is He, Lord Sabaoth His name, from
Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 18 through 39. Again, that's Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 39. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, you are free from any and all types of corruption. In you there is only goodness, righteousness, and love. You are pure and holy in a way we don't quite understand, completely unlike us or your creation. You are distinct, separate, and glorious. And so we worship you and pray with hearts lifted up and with hearts humbled by your forgiveness and grace. And we proclaim that your name is great. Your name is wonderful. You are our joy and our pleasure, our peace and our shelter. Your name is a mighty fortress, and no one who calls on your name will ever be shamed. And so, once again, we pray to you and declare that you are perfect and free from any and all types of corruption. But not so the world. We know and see that the world is so full of darkness and sin and corruption of all kinds. God, we face tribulation and troubles, distress and tragedies, persecution and sharp injustices, famine and hunger and disease, nakedness and need danger and the sword, and death with as many faces. But Father, you stand above all these things. You stand over them. You have conquered each and every one. You have defeated sin and death. 
You have overcome all of the corruptions of this world, and you cause us to stand with confidence too, by purifying and redeeming us from the corruption in our own hearts, our own sin. Yes, we are guilty before you, yet you have chosen us. You have called us to you. You have justified us and you have glorified us. What can we say to you, Lord? What can we say but thank you for this great salvation purchased by the cleansing blood of the Lamb? You have cleansed us, and yet we still see corruption in the world. And we trust you when you say that creation has been subjected to futility for a short time until you make all things new. You have made us new, and now we eagerly wait for your return and for that day when all things will be made new. No more corruption, no more death, no more birth pains. We see that glorious end, Lord. We see it in our mind's eye, and we long for and hope for it. Oh, what a glorious day that will be when we stand before you in the new heavens and a new earth and the new Jerusalem. But we know that a path to that new Jerusalem is through the thorny ways. And even those thorny ways are meant for our good and our strengthening inwardly and by your spirit. We pray then for the church global as we all face a common threat today, the coronavirus. Above all, let your people around the world stay true to the faith and seek comfort in your word. Let your people be quick to encourage and care for one another. Let this whole situation cause us, your people, to stand out clearly from the rest of the world, that in our saltiness you might bring many more to salvation. Use your church in any way you will to bring you glory. Use us for all that you desire, the saving of those who are lost. And secondly, regarding coronavirus, we pray for your people and your churches around the world who have been hit the hardest, that you would maintain them in unity by your strength, that you would not allow them to fall into despair, and that you would open the doors for them to receive the medical attention they need. Enable your people around the world who are already under forced lock lockdown to continue to worship you in whatever capacity available to them. We pray that you would maintain the bonds of fellowship in whatever ways possible, but especially through prayer. Lord, we are mindful that we too here are a church affected by these global events, and we are worshiping you perhaps for the very first time in GBC's history, remotely and virtually, disconnected and yet connected. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of technology you've given us to make this possible. We pray that our brothers and sisters are able to join us for each Sunday that we must do this. And though we're grateful for the internet, help us to stay most connected with each other through prayerful intercession for one another during this unique season, this season that reminds us of the corruption of the world and which causes us to cling all the harder to you, the unchangeable I am. Protect us in these times and ground us firmly in your word. We pray for the most vulnerable people in our congregation, the sick and the elderly, those healthcare professionals among us, and the essential employees, that you would protect them from exposure to the coronavirus, and that you would let them feel your protective hand over them. Father, we also pray that you would continue to meet our physical and financial needs, knowing that you promised to do so already as we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Lord, all these things that we've been praying, we pray again for our friends at Aletheia Church and Bowie Presbyterian Church, that their members might be encouraged and praying for one another, that you would maintain their unity, and that you would protect the most vulnerable. Father, we trust you, and we rely on you, and we give you the praise, the glory, and honor that is due your name and your name alone. And we pray these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Sing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Oh, right. 
summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, you, O Lord, the perfection of beauty, shine forth. You do not keep silent, and before you is a mighty fire, around you a mighty tempest. You call to the heavens above and to the earth below, that you may judge your people. You gather us to yourself, and the heavens declare your righteousness. You, O oh God, are our judge. You will speak, O oh God, and you will testify against us. You are God, our God, and you rebuke us. You don't accept the works of our hands to accomplish atonement for our sins, as if you need us for anything at all. Lord, before we try to serve you, help us to first have a heart of gratitude and thanksgiving. Lord, we are often ungrateful. And we don't always turn to you in times of trouble. We don't always give you glory for the way you have delivered us. We as lawbreakers have no right to recite your laws. We, we listen to your word and yet we, we turn away from it. We turn, we throw your word behind us. We speak wrong against our brothers and our sin sisters. We slander them. Lord, we lie and we, we keep company with adulterers. We approve of, of thieves and liars. Lord, we often mistake your silence and lack of swift judgment for affirmation and acceptance. But you hate all sin and will strongly rebuke us, laying the charges against us. Help us, God, to order our way rightly, to offer thanksgiving from sincere hearts, and to not forget you lest we face your wrath and there be none to deliver. Show us then your salvation, O God. Amen. Let's sing the hymn, In Christ Alone My Hope is Found. Oh, 
seems hopeless. Father, the hope of our Savior Jesus Christ of eternal life mm. sustains us, guides us, encourages us, Father. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Good morning, and if you have your Bible with you, you can go ahead and open up to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49, as I'll be reading all of Genesis 49, verses 1 through 33. Genesis Chapter 49. Then Jacob called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. Assemble and listen, O sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Unstable as water, you shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers, weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel. O oh, my glory, be not joined to their company, for in their anger they killed men, and in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him? 
The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, binding his foal to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine, and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun shall dwell at the shore of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall be at Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey crouching between the sheepfolds. He saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant, so he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant of forced labor. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backwards. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. Asher's food shall be rich, and he shall yield royal delicacies. Naphtali is a doe let loose that bears beautiful fawns. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring, his branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, and harassed him severely, yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile. By the hands of the mighty one of Jacob, from there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your father, who will help you. By the Almighty, who will bless you with blessings of heaven above. Blessings of the deep that crouches beneath. Blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of your father are mighty beyond the blessings of my parents. Up to the bounties of the everlasting hills, may they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who was set apart from his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf in the morning, devouring the prey, and at evening, dividing the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. This is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessings suitable to him. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. This is God's living and active word. And uh, Let's ask God now to not only bless the reading of it, but to help us understand and apply it to our hearts. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we are grateful Again, as has already been prayed, we're grateful for the gift of technology to be able to stream and, and, and uh, spread uh, this service, if you will, across boundaries and geographic locations so that within the safety of our own homes, we can hear your word read and preached. But Father, we're, we're more grateful for the gift of your word, Father, that you have You've allowed us to have your word, which is without error, which is living and inspired, which gives life and illuminates. And Father, we pray that you would use your word now as we hear it preached and unpacked, Father, that you would use it to pierce into the depths of our hearts. Sharper it is than any two-edged sword. And we pray, Father, that you would use it to convict us of sin but Lord, also encourage us in faithfulness. Strengthen us, nourish us, we pray, by your word. And allow us herein to see the glory and beauty of our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, welcome to what is kind of Greenbelt Baptist Church. Uh, just a bit of a background on who we are and, and how we understand preaching. As a church, the, the central aspect of our service is on the Word of God uh, preached and heard. 
We believe that uh, God speaks to us through his scriptures, and it is in hearing his scriptures where our hearts are brought to communion with God. As such, we, we, we hold a high value on preaching through the Bible uh, consecutively, chapter after chapter. And so for the last year and a half, we've been preaching through the book of Genesis. And uh, we're coming now to the end of Genesis here, as we've read in Genesis chapter 49. And what that means is we, we seek to understand any given text, first in its context, uh, and then apply it to, to where we are today. And so we encourage you to have your Bible open uh, as you kind of watch online, as we will continually go back to the passage and seek to understand what each text is saying. The account that is before us this morning, Genesis 49, is an account of Jacob blessing his 12 sons at the end of his life. This chapter gives us really a wonderfully intimate glimpse into the end of Jacob's life. Here is his, his near-death bed moment. His last words and thoughts as he prepares to pass from this world into the next. Certainly the, the world has, has more and more kind of been forced to reckon more honestly with the reality of death. We're, we're all kind of thinking about it more these days. Perhaps you've found yourself late at night, lying in bed, pondering more acutely your own death, whether or not you are in fact ready to die. Well, here is, here is a dying godly man in Genesis 49 who with these last words of his shows us where his heart and his mind are ultimately focused. What we need to see, of course, is that these last words of blessing uh, are the blessings of Jacob, the man who was the recipient of God's covenant promises. He is the patriarch through whom God would call to himself a distinct nation, a people group, and who would, as a nation, be a broader blessing to the world. So these blessings God is giving to Jacob's sons is really the covenant blessings of God specifically applied to each son, all of whom together make up the nation of Israel. So look there in verse 28. We read there in verse 28, and notice the triple repetition of blessing there. Quote, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel. This is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. These blessings, although they're given individually here, are really in the context of their corporate identity as, as a people group, as the nation of Israel. Or to put it another way, what Jacob has in mind here is not so much his sons individually, but what God had promised concerning the land and the people who would come from Jacob to dwell in that land. His heart, Jacob's heart is looking far down into the future, and he's He's captivated by what he sees. Look at what he says in verse 1. Jacob called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. Do you see? In the face of death, at the end of life, what is Jacob's heart and mind consumed with? It's with the promises God made concerning the future the future of the people of Israel dwelling later in the land of Canaan. So sure is Jacob that these promises will come to pass, that he makes his sons commit to doing what? Look there at verse 29. Verse 29, Jacob commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron, in that cave that is the field of Machpelah. Abraham bought that field from Ephron to possess as a burying place. He says, bury me there with Abraham and, and with Isaac, my father, and, and with, with my wife, Leah. We need to begin where Jacob begins. And, and yes, that's with his mind meditating on and, 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 and grounded in the future promises of what God has established. We also need to see where he begins with blessing his sons. And that's with the older brothers, Reuben, Simeon, 
and Levi. Those are the first three. And what becomes clear is that, well, rather than blessings, they actually receive severe denunciations. These are anti-blessings. They're, they're curses. Why? Well, because they disqualified themselves. Reuben, though he is the firstborn, look what Jacob says uh, <clears throat> in verse 3. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. You can almost see Reuben looking around at his other brothers with his chest out and a, and a big proud smile on his face. But all of that amounts to nothing because of what we see in verse 4. You are as unstable as water. You shall not have preeminence. Why? Because you went up to your father's bed and you defiled it. He went up to my couch. If you remember, Reuben, in a selfish grab at power, slept with Bilhah, one of his father's mistresses, all in order to shift the center of power away from Bilhah and her children, and more toward his own mother and her children, namely himself. But it all backfired. Jacob, now instead of blessing Reuben, he gives him a curse. And the same holds for Simeon and for Levi, these two older brothers who have shown nothing but a proclivity towards violence and revenge. Remember, they massacred an, an entire village of people. Well, they also disqualified themselves from receiving divine blessing. Again, all because of their sin, their, their disqualification. All of this is, of course, as Kent Hughes puts it, all of this is but the residuals of sin catching up. In other words, as the Apostle Paul instructs us in Galatians 6, we reap what we sow. There are consequences to our sins. And here's the wild thing we need to see. Often enough, there are long-term and generational repercussions to our choices, be they sinful or not. What's startling about Jacob's words here to Reuben and Sibian and Levi is that they're a prophetic description of what the tribes of Reuben and Simeon and Levi will be generations down the road. Do you see? There's something portrayed here, which generally speaking bears out in the rest of scriptures as well, which is this. How you live your life now, the decisions you make, the words you speak, the God or the God's lower G you choose to follow. All of that will be either a blessing to your descendants or a curse. We often say things like, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And for the most part, that's true to reality. We're so often shaped and informed, either consciously or unconsciously, by the character and lives of our parents or through those who were most influential on us growing up. Consider the original readers of this text in Genesis 49. Uh, the fifth and sixth generation of descendants of Reuben and Simeon. What do you think they were thinking when they first read this passage? Perhaps they were upset at the sinful decisions of their forefathers, sure. But perhaps they also saw their forefathers here as a warning as a kind of example to make sure that, that the sin in their own lives was really being dealt with, and that, that their own children and their children's children might experience blessing because of their faithfulness rather than curses due to unbelief. Friends, it's not legalism or strict religiosity to say that how you live matters. But of course, we have to recognize, and, and this is really what the Bible is all about, we have to recognize that how we live is really only the evidence and outworking of what we really believe. How we live is the fruit of what we believe. If you're watching in this morning and this is your first time kind of listening to a sermon either from this church at Greenbelt Baptist Church or any other gospel-believing church, I want you to know what the Bible makes explicitly clear. This is what's known as the gospel or the good news. And it's this, that it's not ultimately what we do or don't do that secures the blessing of eternal life. Or rather, it's our reliance upon what Christ has done that secures the blessing 
of our eternal life. And how we live, the the choices we make and the actions we carry out, all of that is just the outgrowth and the evidence of what and who we believe. You see, what the Bible makes absolutely clear is that there's never anything we could do to gain the blessing of eternal life by ourselves. In and of ourselves, we are all too sinful, too rebellious, even the best of us. As long as we continue to not believe in and rely upon Jesus Christ, even our good works, because they're not done out of a pure reverence for or worship to God. Even the best things we do are an affront and offense to God. And that's really bad news. Indeed, because of our status as guilty before a holy God, we stand, all of us, condemned. And we can never do enough good things to outweigh the bad and the guilt. So please don't misunderstand me when I say that how we live matters. It it, it does. We reap what we sow. There are always repercussions, even eternal repercussions to our decisions. But how we live can never be the grounds for gaining the ultimate blessing of eternal life. We We just don't have it in us to do that. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not only not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. As the apostle John says in John 3, verse 18, whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. Friends, that's good news. That's the gospel. And that's what we pray you would hold on to today, that you you would believe in, that you would rely upon Jesus Christ. And out of that comes a changed life. Well, what becomes more and more clear in this chapter, where Jacob is prophetically blessing or, or not blessing his sons, is that there are two sons, Joseph and Judah, who are particularly held up as preeminent in blessing. If you're looking at chapter 49 in front of you, you can even see this visually. 10 of the 25 verses used in this poem are directed to just these two sons. I think we'll see is how Jacob's blessing toward them. Again, this is a blessing that is geared toward the future, especially for Judah. And particularly for Judah, it's a blessing that finds its fulfillment far in the future, really in the coming of a Messiah. In other words, what we read here concerning Judah is nothing other than the gospel of Jesus Christ kind of exploding out of this ancient Old Testament text. Both of these sons, Joseph and and Judah, they're both blessed, that's clear. But there is a significant difference between the two. With Judah, we see Jacob giving a divine prophecy about God's far future purposes, Whereas with Joseph, we see a divine word about God's already fulfilled purposes. In other words, we see Jacob emphasize a future purpose with his son Judah. And then by contrast, we see Jacob emphasize God's current purposes with and in Joseph. So let's start with Joseph in verses 22 through 26. Joseph, well, he already stood out among his brothers. For one, he was decked out in the regalia of Pharaoh's court. He was the second most powerful man in all the ancient Near East. And yet here he was with his other brothers now bowed down before the far more royal hand of blessing coming from his aged and dying father, Jacob. How does Jacob begin his blessing of Joseph? By describing in beautiful imagery the kind of man Joseph had become. Verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring, his branches run over the wall. The metaphor is evocative of a kind of well-watered tree that's so healthy and and heavy with fruit that its branches are hanging low over garden walls, offering its fruit to anyone who passes by. Certainly this is what Joseph had been for his family, even for the surrounding world during the famine. During the years that followed Jacob's death, Joseph would remain this kind of fruitful tree for Israel, 
That is, until a new king would arise in Egypt. As Exodus goes on to tell us, a king who did not know Joseph. And yet, as Jacob goes on to describe in verse 23 and 24, all of this fruitfulness only really came about through trials and suffering. Do you see that? The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, and harassed him severely, yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. The imagery of arrows being used here are probably used to represent the wicked words that Joseph first experienced from his brothers, then the unfair and lying words that he was pierced with by Mrs. Potiphar, and in then even all the backstabbing he experienced from folks who no doubt resented his rise out of obscurity and out of prison and into the court of Egypt. How could Joseph stand firm and maintain faithfulness in the midst of such trying times, piercing arrows meant to cut him down? And remember, he was mistreated, misrepresented and mishandled for over 40 years, a slave and then lost in obscurity to a dark prison. And the reason he could persevere through these trying times is because of what we see in verses 24, 25, and 26. It was God who kept him. God was the one quietly preserving him and strengthening him, using every trial and every hard moment, not to break Joseph, but to what? To mold him and build him and conform him into the godly man he is now as he stands before his dying father. Look at those verses starting in verse 24. His bow remained unmoved. His arms were agile. Why? Because of the hands of the mighty one of Jacob, from there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. It was by the God of your father who will help you, by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that crouches beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. There's such rich theology in this blessing. Jacob has a theology of God which which is deep and majestic, describing a God who is mighty and yet one who is a tender shepherd, a God who cares for his people like a shepherd cares for his sheep. But notice he's also a stone. He's this unmovable and sturdy rock, unchanging, impassable, unmoving from eternity to eternity. He is El Shaddai, the Almighty One. And yet, verse 25, he is also the God of Joseph's fathers. He's imminent and intimate, a God who helps his people. Friends, let us not miss the point in this chapter, which is a chapter about blessing. There is no blessing outside of knowing this God. The God of the Bible is the one true God, the eternal and almighty God who has revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as we'll see in just a moment, he's the God who has revealed himself preeminently in his son, Jesus Christ. Joseph went through some very dark and dangerous times. And the blessing being described here by his father is the blessing of being preserved and, and grown in through those hard times. Friends, I don't think I have to prove to anyone listening in right now that we are now ourselves in the midst of very hard times. And yet the same God who preserved Joseph through his child, through his troubles, is the same God today, unchanged. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter eight, a passage which Will read and prayed out of earlier, Paul says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. And what's striking about that passage is that Paul assumes that if we are not found in Christ, that is, if we're not believing in and unified to Christ by faith, then those hard times and, and these trials and, and these moments of suffering are not always used by God for our good. But if we do love God, 
Well, then all things work together for good, working in such a way that is in keeping with God's good and loving purposes. And that was true for Joseph, and that's true for all of God's children, but that's not true for those who are still refusing to believe in Jesus. Who is this Jesus? Well, it's what we want to look at now, at the blessing which Jacob gives to his son Judah in verses 8 through 12. As Judah awaited his father's words, it must have struck him as a complete surprise that the oracle his father was about to pronounce, <laughs> it had far-reaching consequences. A blessing that carried within it the very heart of the gospel itself. The words seen in verse 8 prophesied first of an astonishing dominance. Do you see that? Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Now, if you've been following along in Genesis, and especially in the last chapters, which have focused in on, on the life of Joseph, Judah's younger brother, well, then these words can't help but surprise you. All of Jacob's sons will bow down to Judah? If Genesis ended in that chapter before, back in chapter 48, and, and all you were told was that the next chapter, chapter 49, would be about Jacob blessing his sons, and then you were tasked to write how you think it should go, what, what would the blessings look like? No doubt we would write that the blessing of the royal ruler to emerge out of Israel, the, the preeminent blessing of the, of the tribe that would rise to reign in regality, well, certainly that would be the tribe of Joseph. It's been Joseph who thus far has shown himself faithful and righteous. It's Joseph who's shown us the wisdom of how to lead a nation in the midst of famine and plague. It's been Joseph who alone has relied in faith upon God even through the darkest moments. And yet the blessing in verse 8 is that it's the descendants of Judah who will emerge as the kings of Israel. It will be from Judah where the great kings of David and the great king of Solomon emerge. Indeed, it will be through Judah through whom the king of kings will come and reign. How does that strike you? Especially knowing that Judah has not shown himself in Genesis to be really that upright or that faithful as a brother. Remember Judah along with the rest of his brothers? Judah sold Joseph into slavery. Judah, along with the rest of his brothers, lied to their father and said Joseph had been killed by an animal. And it was Judah who failed to care for his daughter-in-law Tamar as a caring and responsible patriarch, even being tricked to sleeping with her. So how does it strike you when you read that it's Judah who receives here the preeminent blessing? Perhaps you're angered, or you think that that's incredibly unfair? If you do, I want to suggest to you that that's probably the point of what's going on in this passage. In other words, what we're seeing here is nothing other than what we've seen throughout Genesis, and that's the surprising nature of God's sovereign grace. It's not who you are or what you do that makes someone to be a recipient of God's grace. If it was, then grace wouldn't be grace. God's grace is his undeserved favor. God's grace is surprising because it bestows blessing upon those who don't deserve it. You can't get God's grace through being religious. You can't earn God's grace by trying harder to be a good person. What we see here with Judah is that God uses and blesses and saves people, not based on some religious system of earning, no, it's entirely and solely grounded in God's extravagant and unmerited love. It's God's love which accounts for why sinners like you and me but don't fall prey to the unchanging justice and holiness of God. If blessing came through what we did or who we are, if salvation was the payment for how we lived our lives, friends, we'd be utterly lost. Every one of us, the only payment we deserve is that of God's just wrath. And yet, love intervenes 
Love intercedes and makes a way for us so that God can still be just and punish our sin. And yet in love also bestow upon us the grace of forgiveness and blessing. But how? How is God both just and righteous in punishing our sin and yet gracious in forgiving our sin? Look at the rest of Jacob's prophetic blessing given to Judah in verses 9 through 12. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Binding his foal to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine, and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, or perhaps we could read that as they sparkle like wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. You notice how there's all this animal imagery which Jacob has been using for his children. He calls Issachar a donkey. He calls his son Dan uh, to be like a serpent. Naphtali is described as a doe. Benjamin as a ravenous wolf. But Judah, Judah is known as a lion. A lion, that, that singularly mighty and regal beast, the king of the animal kingdom. And you can see that in how the prophetic blessing continues. The scepter, that, that ruling scepter, shall, shall never depart from him, nor the ruler's staff. All the peoples of the world will bow down to him. The imagery of this prophecy is moving fast away from Judah himself and looking far down into Judah's distant future to the coming of a Messiah, a descendant of Judah who will reign not only over the tribes of Israel, but who will be a king over the whole world. And it's this king which the New Testament refers to as Jesus Christ. As Revelation tells us, it is Christ who is known as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And it's precisely here, friends, where we see God in his wonderful love that begin to establish grace right alongside his justice. How grace and justice can be reconciled, we see it here. Notice what kind of king this is who will come into the world. Verse 11 and 12. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, here a, a clear prophecy fulfilled by Jesus himself as he marches in to Jerusalem riding the colts of a donkey. He washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Prophetically, we see the Messiah here riding into his kingdom with humility, riding his donkey. And yet it's a kingdom but yes, he, he begins to establish through humility, but it's a kingdom that will clearly overflow with blessing. Do you see that? The, the imagery here of the Messiah tying his colt to a choice vine and, and, and washing his garments in wine, it's the image of wine being so abundant that the vines of a vineyard are, 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 are everywhere to be found and so robust that someone could do, tie his donkey to them. Wine flows so abundantly that there's more of it than water. It's as if people will use wine to wash their clothes. In other words, this coming king will really usher in a kingdom of extravagant blessing. But that blessing, as verse 11 seems to intimate, and this is key, that blessing will only come through the curse which befalls this coming king. When Jacob prophesies that the Messiah will wash his garments in wine and his vestures in the blood of grapes, he's intentionally tying the glory of that final blessing first with the agony of the cross. The wine will come. We will, we will enjoy finally in that future kingdom of Jesus where there will be an eternal feast of blessing. Yes. But all of that, which I think we all know is still, still far into the future, all of that could only come about because of what Jesus did upon the cross. 
shedding his blood and giving his life for us. Notice that there in the text. The, the blessings of this passage, the blessings which Judah is receiving here, point forward to an ultimate curse, a curse which will fall upon this, this line of the tribe of Judah, a curse which will fall upon one of his great, great descendants. And it's in this curse through which we, we who deserve God's curse, we who deserve God's judgment, it's in the curse of the cross of Christ wherein we can receive the surprising blessing of God's grace. Oh, dear friends, I hope you see here how God is showing us the surprising nature of his grace, how, how he can still be just and holy, not looking over our sins and still maintaining his righteousness to punish our sin, and yet still in his love show us unmerited grace and favor. It's in the person of Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who alone was a man without sin, the man who alone never deserved the curse of God's fierce wrath, and yet he took that judgment on our behalf. His garments were drenched in the blood of his own life, offered up for you and me. Friends, it's there in his person where we alone can find the ultimate blessing of God's saving grace. Again, if if you've not believed in Jesus Christ, here is the gospel in Genesis 49, a passage which points forward to the blood shed by Jesus Christ for you so that by faith in him, you can then also enjoy the blessing of what's to come. Yes, the blessings of eternal life, an eternal feast overflowing with wine before him forevermore in glory. This is what the Lord's Supper is all about and signifies. It, it looks back to the curse of Christ's shed blood, but it looks forward to the blessing of enjoying that wine and enjoying bread with Christ forever. Friends, I pray that if you've not believed in Jesus, you would do so, clinging to him. As Jacob blesses Judah. Receive that blessing by clinging to to Judah's great, 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 great descendant, Jesus Christ. In him are these blessings materialized, are these blessings to be found. I pray that as we continue to go through interesting times, that we would, we would cling to Christ, even though we look around and it, it seems that maybe, maybe these are times that are devoid of any blessing at all. In Christ, there is future blessing to be had. Jacob dies here, looking forward to the future of the Messiah coming. Uh, we can walk through these times. We can face death with even greater assurance because we know that Messiah, Jesus Christ, and we know in him there is eternal life to come. Let's pray. pray together. Our great Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise for the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his shed blood on our behalf, Father, our only means of reconciliation to you as sinners, as rebels, as enemies by birth. Father, we thank you for the blessing that is found in the gospel of Christ. Father, we thank you for the blessing that is found in his kingdom in being united to him through faith. Father, we are reminded in scripture again and again of the, the glorious inheritance that is found for the saints in union with Christ. Father, blessings that are unimaginable, blessings that make the good things of this world seem as, as dirty rags. Father, would you, by the power of your Spirit, cause us to cling ever more to the gospel of Christ? To, to, by faith, trust in Christ more every day as our only source of salvation. Father, to, to more and more every day uh, trust less in ourselves and in our own work and in our own good deeds, knowing that they do have lasting consequences, Father, but they are not of ultimate, 
ability to reconcile us to you. Father, would you build our faith and trust in you and in, our, and in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, would you, in this time, remind us of the, the, the blessings that are found only in Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Let's sing now, Hark I Hear the Harps Eternal. Prince of Peace, who is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ our Savior.